In the tombs that ancient Egyptians prepared for their deaths, they left a record of how they lived more than 3,000 years ago. But the full meaning of many of the images remains a mystery. In almost every noble's tomb, one image stands out, the blue lotus, a type of water lily which is everywhere. But why should the lotus be associated with the dead? Late in 1999, scientists in Manchester began a series of tests to uncover the secret of the lotus. They were looking in part at the flower itself. But their tests also had another focus, an ancient Egyptian who would have encountered the lotus, a mummy 3,000 years old. It would turn out that the team would uncover some of the remarkable properties of the lotus and the links between the flower, the afterlife and sex in ancient Egypt. People had looked at the, uh, the pictures in the, in the tombs and they predicted certain things. But we've actually got evidence now. Now the speculation can be laid to one side and we can actually go after the, the hard evidence, the proof. And discoveries such as, as this are very, very important. Egyptologists interested in the day-to-day -day life of the ancient Egyptians have learned a large part of what they know by studying the detailed scenes recorded in the tombs. But these images are not a way of remembering the lives of the departed. They're intended to promote the tomb owner's chances of rebirth and well-being in the afterlife. After death, they believe these scenes would become real. Ancient Egyptian tombs are not sterile, they aren't places just to put the dead and leave them in a, in a, in a pretty little tomb. Far from it, they're kind of powerhouses, they acted as generators in which everything placed in there, it wasn't done on a whim, it was done with a purpose. The equipment, the tomb scenes and so forth, they all literally scream out life, it's encouraging the dead to live, they're just exhorting the, the, the mummy, you know, live again. But not all the scenes are quite what they seem. Artifacts found in tombs make clear that rebirth also involved procreation and sex. Mummies were buried with little fertility dolls to symbolize rebirth. Male mummies were often buried with artificial phalluses. And many of the tomb images in which everyone is always young are thought to have a hidden sexual meaning. The depiction of sex was quite, um, not quite hidden, but coded almost. It's as if it's a secret coded language that was used. There's still a considerable way to go before we understand all the subtle nuances because the ancient Egyptians were, if anything, rather subtle people when it came to portraying such a, a volatile and potentially dangerous act as sex. One of the most common images in the tombs is the blue lotus, but its significance has never been fully understood. Might the lotus also be a sexual symbol of some kind? Egyptologist Lisa Manike has been investigating the blue lotus and its connections with both love and sex. The village of Dea El Medina near Luxor was used by the workmen who built and decorated the tombs of the pharaohs in the Valley of the Kings but they also produced one of the most infamous of Egyptian drawings, a papyrus which added a new dimension to the symbolism of the lotus. The people in this village were quite gifted craftsmen. Among the interesting drawings that we do have from this place, 
is the famous Turin Papyrus. I think it is a very interesting piece of early pornographic literature. It's not kind of continuous story about what went on on a wild night in Dera Medina, but it shows various couples having intercourse in various fashions. There's a scene showing a woman sitting on a stool with a man facing her with a huge phallus and a lotus flower balancing on top of her head. In one of the other scenes, the woman seems to be managing quite well on her own because she's sitting on top of an inverted pot with a pointed bottom, enjoying herself in that way. Again with a huge lotus flower on top of her head. Was this connection between the lotus and sex a clue to the role of the lotus in Egyptian life? Was the lotus more than just a symbol? Lisa Manike thinks so, and she has also tracked down another clue. One hundred kilometers upriver from Luxor is a temple known as Edfu. Here, there is evidence which suggests that the significance of the lotus is based on some undiscovered properties of the plant. Lisa Manike has tracked down a piece of text in the temple which could make sense of the lotus's central importance in Egyptian life. In the Temple of Horus, the walls are full of pictures showing the king offering to the god. Quite often he would offer a lotus flower, but the accompanying texts suggest that the lotus may have had narcotic properties. The king speaks about the lotus flower to the god and he says, when you look at its brilliance, your eyes become dynamic or imbued with dynamic properties. When you breathe in, your nostrils dilate. And I think this is a very good description of a person sniffing narcotic substance. Lisa Manike is sure that this explanation of the effect of the lotus on the gods also reveals how the Egyptians used it themselves, that it was a narcotic or a stimulant of some kind. There are hints in the tomb paintings that this is true. Here too, the lotus is often being sniffed. And there is a close association with wine. Wine goblets were often decorated to look like the lotus. And little jars of concentrate are seen being added to the wine. Might these also be derived from the lotus? Was the secret of the lotus that it was a drug which the Egyptians used in much the same way as alcohol? And did they sometimes combine them, soaking the flowers in wine? Was this what lay behind the images in the tombs and on the erotic papyrus? In Manchester, they now plan to find out if the Egyptians had been taking drugs, they hoped that this mummy would reveal the evidence. She was at the center of a research project to establish the truth about the lotus and other mysteries of Egyptian life. The team was led by Dr. Rosalie David, keeper of Egyptology at the museum. The mummy came into the Manchester Museum in 1825. Uh, she was given to the museum by two private individuals together with two wooden coffins and from the inscriptions on the coffins we know that her name was Azru and that she was a singer, a chantress in the temple at Karnak. Unfortunately there's a great deal we don't know about the mummy. Science, we hope, will reveal the truth about the lives of the ancient Egyptians. You know, you need, you need to go there. Kevin. Just there. Yeah. Azru's wrappings were removed by her owners in the 19th century. That made access to her skin and organs, the key to the experiments, much easier for the scientific team. Does it feel quite solid, that? It's very hard. The, well, you can hear it. I think you're yeah. on the bone, really, there. 
got a small amount of tissue. That's some tissue from the close to it. <coughs> it would have been quite, quite nice. To the team planned to obtain a number of minute samples of uncontaminated tissue from inside Azru's body. Yeah. They would search for any signs of the lotus or drugs of any kind which Azru might have been taking, perhaps for recreational purposes or possibly for ritual or medicinal reasons. There's no evidence that the Egyptians used narcotics until very much later, but no one has ever examined a mummy with the range of new technologies they now planned. It's very gungeon. Resonance. As well as Azru's tissue, they also needed hair samples. Since drugs slowly accumulate in hair, these can reveal drug use over a long period. However, finding hair on Azru was not a simple task. Her head had been shaved, and the only hair they could find was body hair. I'll take some hair and then I'll take it. Yes, you could call it um, just pubic hair. Pubic hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. It was Azru's role as a temple chantress, which meant she had to be shaved. Removing hair, wearing wigs instead, was thought necessary for ritual purity. Her coffin explains she lived in Thebes, now known as Luxor, the religious capital of Egypt. One thousand years before Christ, near the end of the New Kingdom, she worked in the Karnak temple. But as a temple chantress, Azru was also an ideal subject for the scientific study. Here she would have come into regular contact with the lotus. As at Edfu, the lotus appears to have a central importance. Lotus symbols are everywhere. Records indicate that a chantress was a kind of part-time priestess, a high-born noble who would live here for weeks at a time. 3,000 years ago it would have been very different. It would have been a very dark place in this inner part of the temple, full of colour, full of life. The floors would polish silver, the walls would be adorned with fine gold and lapis lazuli. These jewel-like colours would be heightened by the shafts of sunlight and the use of incense and sweet perfumes would absolutely suffuse the whole building. Azru's role with the other chantresses was to support the priests in looking after the deities in the temple. This included bringing offerings of the lotus flower. In the morning, they would chant to wake the gods. Three times a day, they would bring food and other nourishment. They would fetch the clothes with which the gods would be dressed by the priests. And throughout the day, they would perform for the gods with singing and dancing. Once the god was awoken in his shrine, then th this divine spirit had to be placated and entertained. And was it only the gods who were being offered the lotus? If the lotus was a stimulant, might the chantresses have used it too for their energetic dancing? You do manage to get an idea of the vigour that many of these rituals would be performed with. We have back bends, back flips, you see the long wigs hanging down beneath them. And we can see here a very, very lively scene. These, these female dancers um, really shown in an energetic pose. And so music and dance were performed, incense was burnt, perfumes were offered. But whether the chantresses and other ancient Egyptians were also using drugs is a mystery which remains to be resolved. In Manchester, as Azru's examination continued, the hope was that if she had been taking drugs, perhaps including the Blue Lotus, they could now begin to find out. And might she also now reveal the secret of the connection between the afterlife, the Lotus, and sex? In Manchester, 
the detailed examination of the mummy Azru was underway. They hoped to discover if the ancient Egyptians used drugs like opium and cannabis, and in particular, the blue lotus. Two members of the team, anaesthetist Dave Council and chemist Vic Garner, had now been given samples of Azru's hair and tissue to test. The evidence for drug use in ancient Egypt, on the whole, is, is controversial. Uh, but it would seem unlikely to me that if the ancient Egyptians had access to these powerful plant drugs, uh, that they wouldn't have used them. But which plants might they have used? The team planned to take advantage of the newest technology to try to find out. Azru's samples were to be analyzed using an extremely sensitive form of mass spectroscopy, which breaks the sample down into the molecules it contains. We've had a look at this uh, sample of hair. The test requires only a minute specimen. This is the Azru hair and scalp sample. There's some very fine pieces of hair in there. The team looked at various types of her tissue and at individual hairs. This is a forensic test which Vic Garner's lab has been using to detect drugs in samples provided by the police. Azru is the first mummy that he's screened. And her samples revealed an enormous range of substances, from plant oils to henna, with some chemicals still to be identified. And we found lots of, of compounds in there, but none of these narcotic compounds. Um, it, it is possible that we may find compounds that may arise from plant material as well, and, and that's what's going on at the moment. Azru appeared free of any known narcotics, but perhaps if the Blue Lotus was being consumed, it actually contained something else. The time had come to take a closer look at what was really in the flower. Finding a flower to test is difficult, since the plants are now very rare and hard to find even in Egypt. One of the few places thought to have the plants, conveniently for Dave Council and Vic Garner, is Stapley Water Garden in Cheshire. Here they have what botanists suspect may be the actual flower revered by the ancient Egyptians. Oh, looks a bit slippy in here, I'm going to have to be careful I think. What's the temperature like down there? I'll tell you in a sec. <laughs> Just, it's very right. pleasant really, it's quite warm. There's no crocodiles in here are there? I hope. I might be cryptosporidium. But, uh, <laughs> I'm going to pass me the uh, secateurs. Thanks. So shall we take these two then, Vic? Yes, but uh, don't touch the petals. If you hold the stem uh, carefully... 25 years ago, American researchers thought they had detected a form of narcotic, an alkaloid, in the lotus. But that work has never been repeated. I've never got to sniff a fresh one, so I think uh, this is about as fresh as it gets, so... It's quite a nice fragrance, actually. It's, it's, it's very nice. What does it smell of? I suppose the nearest thing I think it was a bit like bananas, really. But it's quite pleasant. I mean, it's quite pleasant. I'd be very interested to know how long the perfume lasts. I wouldn't smell it too for too long, though, because the uh, ancient Egyptians, one theory is that, that they used to get high from sniffing it. The blue lotus obviously contains something in there. Um, it, it must be something more than just the appearance of the flower. It must be perfume, it may be that there's some material in there that has a physiological effect. They decided to test both the chemicals found in the flower itself and in the flower's perfume. They were looking for any substance which could give the flower the effects of a drug. What they actually found was completely unexpected. Ah, right, OK, so we've got a lot of noise and no real peaks. So on the base of that, you would say that the, there's no material corresponding to that particular alkaloid. There were no signs of any narcotic, but they made their first important discovery. 
really we're seeing phytosterols. These were phytosterols, plant steroids, which often have powerful medicinal effects. And then as they looked more closely, they made a breakthrough. We kept on with our analyses. We've used a different type of analysis and we've found some material that could have an effect. This is now very exciting. A different type of liquid-based mass spectroscopy was able to detect molecules too big to show up before. What they found were substances called bioflavonoids. These are chemicals which are responsible, amongst other things, for the colouring of plants. But they're also known to have important uses as drugs. And in the lotus, there were three bioflavonoids. It was the combination of all the chemicals they'd now found which might give the lotus powerful physiological effects. Combing the literature, they looked for other plants with a similar chemical makeup and it was the three bioflavonoids which proved the key. They're very common in the plant kingdom. Uh, they're responsible for a lot of colours and so forth, but they also occur in a, a lot of preparations that are used to this day, like ginseng uh, and also ginkgo biloba. Ginkgo biloba is a leaf extract now widely used to stimulate blood flow and improve mental alertness. And when they analysed it, the results were startling. When we compared the data from the ginkgo extract and the blue lotus extract, we found several points of similarity. There are so many points of similarity that we think that the effects of these two materials may also be similar. The health benefits of ginkgo have been known about for centuries. So might the Egyptians have used the lotus in a similar way? Was this why they might have soaked the flowers in wine? They arranged to see an expert who could tell them exactly what effects the lotus would have had. Liz Williamson is a pharmacognosist, a chemist able to assess the effects on the body of different substances. And it was the complex combination of chemicals found in the lotus which excited her. Well, I think you've established that the chemistry um, of the two is fairly similar, particularly around the flavonoid region. And it looks like the lily is even richer in these flavones than ginkgo itself, which suggests that the ancient Egyptians would use it in a similar way to that which we use ginkgo for nowadays. And we are using ginkgo for a lot of different conditions, but the main ones are probably for um, age-related age deteriorations. Um, it's known as a kind of anti-aging herb. It's a free radical scavenger and antioxidant. And it's particularly um, been shown to be useful in mild Alzheimer's and memory dysfunctions and various conditions where blood flow is at fault, so with, um, migraine, um, tinnitus and so forth, and even um, that would even um, involve the sort of Viagra-like effect, which would be just as important for women as men. And it, uh, it looks like we have, you know, great similarities. The ability of the lotus to stimulate blood flow suddenly highlighted the missing connection between the lotus and sex. And I noticed you'd found, um, you found a couple of compounds which um, are phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and, and that's the way that Viagra works. Thank you very much. Good. So the lotus was not only a general panacea, it was also a natural form of Viagra, potentially the key to both health and sexual vigor. Did this at last make sense of the different ways the lotus had been portrayed? Had the team discovered the secret of the lotus? Vic and Dave decided they had to make one last check. How could they be positive that the lily used by the ancient Egyptians really was the same plant as the one they had sampled at Stapley? And would it have had the same Viagra-like effects? At Kew Gardens, in addition to their collection of modern water lilies, they also have priceless samples of the Egyptian blue lotus itself, dating back to the pharaohs. They agreed that Vic and Dave could take a sample. In the grounds, 
they passed one of the oldest ginkgo biloba trees in Britain. Botanically, this seems a very long way from a water lily. Did the blue lotus of ancient Egypt really have the same properties? You can yeah. see why it's called by lobe. Yeah, there. two lobes and the leaves, yeah. really. And you see it's a very leathery leaf. Yeah. Very old plant, supposed to be, isn't it? A bit of a yes. throwback. Well, you actually see things like this in uh, carboniferous fossils. Yeah, yeah. yeah it? Can you smell anything on it? No. It doesn't really smell much, does it? In Kew's underground archive are thousands of dried specimens collected from all over the world. Egyptian specialist Nigel Hepper led them to flowers and wreaths which had come from Egyptian tombs. One with the blue water lily. There's not much doubt about that, is there? Oh, no, it's been yeah. taken off the one underneath yes. and the remantled. The petals are absolutely exact. That's Tremendous. from the coffin of uh, Ramses II. Right. right. Now, it's the other one here, another drawer. This is the one that we probably can use. This is from Hawara. It's uh, excavated by... The when this wreath was first assembled, it would have been a colourful arrangement of blue, yellow, white and green. Now it needed the eye of an experienced botanist to identify the blue lotus amongst the dried petals. We can't use any that's actually still fixed in the wreath, but uh, there are some here. Yes, look, there's a nice bit. Oh, lovely, yeah. And I'll put it on there. We don't want to take any more than necessary, really, so... Right. We can just it's trim a, trim a right. small amount There's off. a pair of uh, forceps. Off there. It's lovely. Thank That's you great. Much. The Q sample. Thank you very much, yeah. Back in the lab, they could now check if the flower of the pharaohs really had the same chemical fingerprint as the modern Two plant they tested. You think you've got enough there for the experiment? Yeah, I can get good results out of, uh, out of one milligram of, uh, of sample. Um, you can get any results, that would be very useful. <laughs> and when they compared the ancient petal from Kew with the modern petal from Stapley, even they were surprised at the match. This is the trace for the Stapley petal, the modern petal. This is the trace from the Kew petal, the old petal, 2,000 years old. And what we're, we're looking at here is the profile of the phytosterols and, and look how similar the profiles are. 2,000 years different and yet the profiles of these phytosterols, these biologically important materials, are practically identical. There could be little doubt that the lotus known to the ancient Egyptians would have had the same properties as the modern plant. But did the ancient Egyptians consume it? Was it really their Viagra? They began the hunt for the telltale lotus fingerprint in tissue obtained from Azru. To date, they've found nothing certain. But some unidentified peaks could be byproducts of the lotus. And the discovery that the lotus has Viagra-like properties has already given a new significance to the many images of the flowers seen in Egyptian tombs. The images of the lotus now fitted perfectly as part of a complex sexual code which Lisa Manike has been deciphering. A code which highlights the importance of sex as the key to rebirth in the afterlife. To be reborn was something that the ancient Egyptians were really obsessed with. And that means that sexuality has a very large part to play in this. For instance, the persons are all in their best age, their reproductive age, and uh, often they are very scantily clad or their garments are quite transparent. Also, scent is very important. Scent underlines sexual matters in all civilizations. And the people here are being anointed with costly oils and perfumes. And they even have lumps of the precious scent placed on top of their heads to show us and to show the other ancient Egyptians how nice they all smelled. And now it seemed that the lotus too, the most common image in the tombs, could also symbolize sex. They wear lotus garlands round their necks, 
Some of them would have lotus flowers decorating their hair. They hold lotus flowers in their hands. The lotus flower is all over the place. As a sexual symbol, the lotus could become the key to an extremely elaborate sexual code. There are lots of plays of words from word to picture and picture to word. For instance, there's a very interesting play of word on the word to ejaculate, seti, and the word to pour. And incidentally, the word for scent is written with the very same three letters, S-T-I, seti. So all this underlines the sexuality of the scene. For the dead, the lotus would stimulate rebirth just as it would be a sexual stimulant for the living. It's a very interesting discovery um, and does have significant ramifications in our understanding of why the ancient Egyptians used the lotus, the image of the lotus, so frequently. And it's interesting now to point something and say, this is obviously where it began. This is one of the means by which they made themselves happy. Soaked in wine, the lotus would not provide an instant boost to the alcohol, but its long-term use would boost the sexual vigor and general health of those who consumed it. I think we really have got to the key for the use of the blue lotus, and the, in my opinion, the blue lotus was not used as a source of narcotics. I think it was used for its beauty, for its perfume, and if it has the added advantage of giving you a, a feeling of well-being when you, you drink an infusion, an alcoholic infusion of this flower, well, that's everything that the pharaohs needed, really, isn't it? And might the importance of the lotus have also derived from its properties as a panacea against disease? Was the truth that illness was in fact widespread in ancient Egypt? As the team continued their examination of Azru, might she provide some answers? A glimpse of the reality which lay behind the images of healthy young people in the tombs. Azru was now undergoing a full medical examination. It was part of the team's attempt to establish the truth about disease in ancient Egypt. The team had already discovered a new significance for the blue lotus, a plant which they had shown would boost both health and sexual vigor. Now they hoped to learn more about the general health of the people. Might the importance of the lotus in ancient Egypt be linked to the prevalence of disease? In the tombs, almost everyone is shown as young and healthy. Occasionally, musicians are shown as blind which might be explained by parasitic diseases. But in surviving medical papyri, it's usually impossible to identify the illnesses described or to establish how prevalent the diseases were. She's probably one of the best behaved patients we've had. She's keeping nice and still yes. and not moving at <laughs> This X-ray scanner was the starting point not only for Azru's medical checkup, but the beginnings of a general health survey of ancient Egypt. Together with the slides being prepared from Azru's tissue samples, they began to reveal just how misleading were the images in the tombs. First to be examined were samples from Azru's intestines. These uh, show quite clear evidence uh, of the larval forms of a worm called Strongyloides in the wall of the intestine. You get the worm uh, by uh, walking in contaminated water or contaminated mud. Uh, the, the mud contains immature forms of the worm which are able to penetrate the skin of the feet or hands uh, and then they get into blood vessels in the body, they get into the veins and travel uh, to the heart uh, where they then in fact get into the lungs. Uh, from the lungs they climb up your windpipe to the back of your throat 
and then you swallow them uh, and in the intestines they develop into the adult forms. If Asru had this disease, and we know that she did, uh, she'd tend to develop diarrhea because of the irritation and because there might well be some bleeding associated with that, uh, Asru might well have been anemic at the time of her death. They also detected sand in Azru's lungs and the scarring of the tissue which the sand had caused. This is a disease called sand pneumoconiosis, still found in desert populations today. Azru would have had great difficulty breathing before she died. Azru was distinctly uh, unwell. She had evidence of quite distinct diseases. Uh, certainly, uh, the combination of them would make her weak uh, might made her, might have made her breathless, uh, and in fact ultimately led to her demise. Through Azru, they were now getting a glimpse of diseases which would have affected the general population. It gave a stark insight into the reality of life at the time, and highlighted the significance of a panacea like the lotus in ancient Egypt. And it was just the beginning. Azru's x-rays revealed the enormous range of illnesses people suffered from. How very different life was from the idealized version in the tombs. Azru was far from young and healthy when she died. In the distal joints of the fingers, there are osteoarthritic changes and these are degenerative joint disease, uh, indicating that she's likely to be an elderly woman, certainly older than 50. Yes. This joint is ankylosed, and this would be uh, indicative of an infective arthritis, a septic arthritis. She might have played a harp, so could this have been connected? Well, if that involved a lot of uh, movement of the uh, phalangeal joints and the fingers, then one could imagine that it would do, because um, osteoarthritis is related to wear and tear on joints. It was clear that Azru would have been living a life of pain. As well as everything else, she had a fractured vertebra in her spine and a badly slipped disc. Or wedged, it's bulging backwards into the spinal canal. Could she have had this as a result of her activities as a, a temple dancer, do you think? I suppose that depends on how, how energetic <laughs> that is. But and there was an important discovery, signs that Azru may have had another far more serious disease. What that is, and that looks very much like the uh, bladder wall, which has calcification in it. And if one saw that in a contemporary x-ray, uh, with extensive calcification of bladder wall, one would think of um, schistosomiasis mm. as a cause for that appearance. She was from an upper-class background, and maybe this contributed to her fairly lengthy life, uh, because she probably had the best diet available and a relatively relaxed lifestyle. Um, she would not have been engaged in housework, there would have been servants in, in the house and so on. Uh, but we also know from this evidence that she had a painful life, uh, diseases that would have brought her uh, physical difficulties. As they sought to understand how many of Azru's diseases might have been widespread, probably the most significant discovery was that Azru may have had schistosomiasis. Until recently, this parasitic disease also called Bilharzia, has been the scourge of modern Egypt. And Rosalie David now needed to establish if it was a similar plague in ancient times. But there has been no certain way to detect Bilharzia, and Rosalie David decided to travel to Egypt to seek help from the experts, the team who have been battling to bring the disease under control. Bilharzia is carried by a parasite which develops in water snails. From there, it infects humans who come into contact with the water, attacking many organs within the body. In Egypt today, 
Alan Fennick advises the team which has brought the disease under control, in part by controlling the snails. And what this gentleman is doing is, uh, is checking the canal for snails. This canal doesn't look particularly attractive, but the point is that fresh water is, is very important. People come down to the canals to wash their clothes, the women come down to wash the dishes, um, men come down when they're building bricks. And you know, when children are coming home from school and it's as hot as it obviously is now, yeah, it's very swim. attractive yes. to dive into the water. <laughs> yeah. In antiquity, some of the activities at least would have been similar in terms of the canals. It's clear from the tomb paintings that the ancient Egyptians performed all the same activities in water. And the country has always been critically dependent on irrigation. So was Bilhazia also widespread then? In modern times, up to 80% of the population have been infected and it has been one of the country's major killers. Recently, dramatic reductions in the incidence of Bilharzia in Egypt have been brought about by regular screening and treatment with modern drugs. But if the ancient Egyptians had Bilharzia, they had little but the lotus for protection. So Rosalie David had brought with her to Egypt samples from several of the Manchester mummies, including Azru, so that they could subject the mummies to the modern screening tests now being used to detect Bilharzia. These tests have been developed by Dr. Magid al shabini and work by detecting antibodies in the blood. So the first task was to liquefy the dry mummy samples. No one has ever found an antibody in a mummy, and most researchers have doubted that it can be done. But to Rosalie David's surprise, one of the tests came out positive. It was the first time an antibody had been detected from ancient Egypt, and it was an antibody against Bilharzia. As you can see now, why we're doing the development is that uh, here is the positive reference samples. Yes. And if you can see in tissue sample number three, we can see that there is some reactivity which yes. comes up, a faint reactivity, but there is activity there. So if this is actually the case, then these are antibodies which are 2,000 years old, yes, these still are, present. Yes, antibodies yeah. extracted from the tissues yeah. and they are still live and active and they are giving us this reactivity here. So this is a first? Absolutely. The finding of this first active antibody from ancient Egypt was clear evidence that the people also suffered from this debilitating and lethal disease. And the finding was confirmed in Manchester when one of the team examining Azru's tissue found direct evidence of the Bilharzia parasite which causes schistosomiasis. We tested Azru for any evidence of schistosomiasis um, within bladder tissue that had been endoscoped from her. Um, and this is showing a section of that bladder tissue um, that's been stained and as you can see, there's fluorescent staining that's actually bound to oval shapes within the bladder, which suggests that she was infected with schistosomiasis. It's very exciting to find evidence of this disease in ASRU. It shows that even somebody of the upper classes could fall prey to this particular disease. It's very likely that the Chantresses had to undergo some kind of ritual ablution, um, bathing in the sacred lake. This could be the way in which she came into contact with a parasite that causes schistosomiasis. If even people like Azru could get the disease, it's likely to have been common amongst the population at large. If you think of a large proportion of the population suffering from this disease, they would have been functioning below par. And they created these wonderful buildings, had this marvellous civilization. That says a great deal, I think, about how they achieved so much, even despite their, their state of health.
In a world where mummies are now showing that the average age of death was around 40, the lotus would be a powerful symbol of life. As this picture of ancient Egypt was coming together, Rosalie David now traveled down to Luxor to look again at the images in the tombs. A new layer of meaning in the tombs was gradually emerging, and the ever-present lotus was the key. I think the fact we know more about uh, the lotus from our scientific studies does really give you a different view of the tomb scenes. Um, you can look beyond the pictures and the, the beauty of the scenes and it gives you an insight uh, into perhaps um, what they were hoping for in the afterlife. The lotus could now be seen as a potent symbol of both rebirth and long life in a world which was actually dominated by disease. Although we always, I suppose, surmised that they had illnesses, it's a great contrast now to have this hard evidence and to look at this uh, in relation to these paintings which show such a different uh, idealised world. Azra probably would have been represented in this very elegant and idealised way, but the physical reality is, is very different from this. 3,000 years after her death, Azru's mummy has opened a new window on a distant past. And a water lily has begun to reveal its fundamental role in Egyptian life, the key to health, sex and rebirth. Together, they've helped uncover the reality of life at the spiritual heart of Egypt at a time when the country's power was at its peak. Now the team in Manchester plan to complete the last stages of their work with Azru, using the images of her skull to reconstruct what she really looked like, the reality which lay behind the images in the tombs. In full makeup and wig, Azru was about to show Rosalie David her true likeness for the first time. Gosh, that's incredible. And she looks, I suppose, as somebody aged about about 60. It's interesting how her upper lip hangs over the bottom yeah. because of course she had those protruding teeth but I don't think it's it's evident in the mummy itself but mm -hmm. it's it's very pronounced there. Well, in her youth she would have been quite uh, quite beautiful really. Through the team's work has come a clearer understanding of the Egyptians yearning for eternal youth in the next world after a life which, even for the elite, was in fact riven by disease. And a new appreciation of the crucial role of a flower, which is a symbol of health and regeneration, was essential for their happiness in an afterlife free of imperfections.